transitioning to a session on appeals, penalties, and prosecutions led by the esteemed Mr. Pramod Kumar, former Vice President ITAC. Mr. Pramod Kumar is a highly experienced chartered accountant with over 15 years in practice and 22 years as a member and Vice President in the Income Tax Appellate Tribunal. He has worked on UND project and served as a director for the International Association of Tax Judges established by the Tax Court of Canada. Mr. Kumar is renowned in India and internationally for his innovative contributions to the field of international taxation and transfer pricing. It's an honor to have you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ritima. Thank you for very kind words. Uh, I'll not be sharing a presentation. I'll okay. speak in general terms. And thank you, Asim, for very kind words. Things uh, which I did not deserve also were included, but that's your <laughs> usual. That's a usual complaint with you anyway. So I'll live with it. My topic today is to talk about appeals, penalties, and prosecutions. And in the last budget, there hasn't been much of a change in this, except in a very peripheral manner. So anyway, whatever little amendments have taken place, uh, I will talk about it and I'll share with you my perspective on what I think about this and what more probably needs to be done. The first and foremost, I'll pick up a rather mundane topic, otherwise mundane, of cross objections. Uh, if you look at section 253.4, 253.4 permitted to file cross objections against the orders of the uh, commissioner appeals. If you read the exact words, it says, that, Assessing officer or the assessee, as the case may be, on receipt of notice that an appeal against the order of the commissioner appeals has been preferred under subsection one or subsection two by the other party, may thereof, within 30 days of the receipt of notice, file a memorandum of cross objection, verified in a prescribed manner against any part of the order of the commissioner appeals, and such memorandum shall be disposed of as if within the time prescribed under subsection three. Now, interestingly, instead of the expression commissioner appeals, what the uh, amendment seeks to do is, it says any part of such order, that is the order appeal against. So if you are thinking about the impact being confined to the DRP order, so far so good. The only practical difference it makes, and that's a difference which has been recognized in the example given in the memorandum explaining the provision, that now the orders, now the cross objection can only also be filed against the orders of the DRC. To that, extent, to that extent, rightly or wrongly, whether it's appropriate, well advised or not, particularly when at the time you receive the order of the DRC, there's already a scrutiny of the order. A call is taken whether to appeal against it or not. And then you want to supplement this call by further opportunity. Uh, when an appeal is filed by the departments, that are passed, but it's understandable. However, when you read the fine print and you read the uh, memorandum, para five particularly, it says something very curious. It says, however, it's pertinent to note that appeal can be uh, made to the appellate tribunal against the orders other than commissioner appeals also, like principal commissioner or commissioner or principal director or director, etc. And then it justifies why so that the parties are on an even ground and opportunity should be given to the assessing officer to file cross objection against this. To be honest, I, it's not clear to me as to which order they have in mind other than the orders of the CRP, but if they are referring to the or, other orders which are passed by the principal commissioner, commissioner, director, principal director, then one has to bear in mind the fact that the question of cross objection is something parallel to appeal. If somebody cannot file an appeal against an order, there can't be a question of cross objection. So I do not know which order of the assessing officer in which order of the director, assessing officer can be an appeal. And you know, to that extent, it should remain in parity. That is one aspect which I would think uh, is little, uh, I'm, I'm sure there must be some good reason for this, just that I couldn't find that good reason beyond the fact that DRP orders are not only appealable for quite some time now, even the uh, cross objection comes up. The other tactical aspect of this cross objection is that my experience uh, in the tribunal tells me 
then generally the question of cross objection doesn't arise because once you have an order which can be appealed against, there is a systematic scrutiny of this order. So once this scrutiny takes place and then a conscious call is taken as to whether this order is to be appealed against or not. Now, the only occasions when cross objections are generally filed by the department are the occasions when during the course of the argument, the arguing counsel or the arguing DR realizes that there was something lacking which needs to be supplemented. Such a practice, to what extent we should encourage such a practice is something on which probably a conscious call is to be taken. And now that uh, it has been done in the case of DRP, I'm sure that's the same manner in which this provision of cross objection is likely to be used. It might mean a few extra appeals so far as the DRP appeals are concerned, where at the time of the argument, DR has a bright idea, departmental representative has an idea about supplementing something which they couldn't decide earlier. That's a conscious revisiting of the appellate right. Well, that's how it is. Now the second important amendment which has taken place uh, in the present budget so far as the appellate mechanism is concerned is revival. I would say revival because except for the name deputy commissioner to joint commission and additional commission, there's not much change. Revival of the another, another level of appeals, another level of functionary in the first appellate process. And that is where the joint commissioner appeal and additional commissioner appeal has been revived. Today, it's something very good, very good from the point of view that people at the helm of the affairs in the government have realized that they have a problem with respect to huge pendency at the first appellate level. And I'm told by the people who know that this figure is an alarming figure, which is around 500,000 cases as on today. Now, 500,000 cases in the first appeals being in process is something very serious. And you have to think about it from this angle, that the average disposal of the tribunal in good old years was just about 50,000. As a matter of fact, those of you who are interested in trivia, the best disposal that we had, uh, the, when I say we, I, refer, I still refer to my old empire, old habits, old habits die hard. The best disposal that the tribunal had in any of the year was in 2004-05, where it was 78,901. Average disposal till four or five years ago used to be 50,000. Now, just imagine this. If 30% of these appeals are to be disposed of, are to be coming to the tribunal, you have 150,000 appeals waiting in the wings for coming to the tribunal. How is it going to clog the system? Thank God people have realized the gravity of the situation. But then the question is how to solve this problem. Can we solve this problem with just some additional hands? Certainly these additional hands will help. And that's why I say it's very thoughtful on the part of the government to have realized that we need to address this alarming issue. But I'm sure that much more than these extra hands, I think that's where the ITAT can share uh, their experiences with the department on quick disposal of the appeals. There was a time when ITAT had a pendency, a docket pendency of 300,000, which should now be around 35,000. It's a huge journey. And that was a time when our, uh, you know, the departmental pendency would probably be 50,000, which is to 500,000. Now, if we have to learn anything from the income tax appellate tribunal, so far as the disposal is concerned, there will be a lot of activities. And even our recent uh, steps, which have been taken the last few years, this is, uh, the, uh, you know, this is something which could show the path to other departments. You have to do the bunching. And you have to ensure that the uh, allotment of the cases to the officers concerned takes into account their profile, their ability to work hard. And then you have to identify the matters where appeals have been filed just to keep the issues alive. And then you have to identify some functional areas and do some bunching on the functional level also. And then I would also think because the uh, uh, pendency has arisen mainly in the cases where the faceless appeal mechanism has been put. You have to take a feedback from the people who are actually manning the affairs, who are actually performing the job as CIT appeal in faceless era. Take some input from them and make some minor adjustments to the mechanism of faceless appeal you have today. If the, the pendency has arisen 
because of the glitches in the faceless process and because of some inherent issues in the functioning of the faceless process. My take of the situation is that unless you address those fundamental issues, just addressing, just increasing the number of hands may not suffice. For last several years, this work has virtually come to a standstill. And as a matter of fact, this has come to a level that whenever this work is disposed, you know, these pending appeals are disposed of, there are going to be many other functional issues, including the issues on how to, you know, uh, address these things in the second appeal. And a quick resolution of a tax dispute is by itself a tax incentive. That quick resolution is, I'm, I'm afraid, under severe, severe problem. We are taking in undue time, unduly long time in disposing of the appeals in the first appellate level. And it is now affecting their, their issues about the collection of the demands in the meantime. There are also issues about ensuring that the demands, which are legitimate demands, these demands are not recovered in the meantime. And now my only apprehension is when we, we know, when I think of the uh, youngsters coming as uh, joint commission appeal, that whether these officers who are not as experienced in the adjudication process and who are not ex as experienced in the revenue service also, whether they'll be able to take the kind of calls which are required to be taken. To a tax consultant, probably it wouldn't make a difference. You are dealing with a faceless process in the CIT appeals in, in most of the areas. And the same thing in all likelihood is likely to continue so far as the, uh, the DC appeal or JCIT appeals is concerned. So now with the increase in the forum, as I said, one good thing is that someone has got the hands at the right place. And this is an issue which is being considered. So once you identify the problem, then there's a good possibility of you being able to solve it. I'm sure with the pragmatic approach that the department has, it should, it should only be a matter of time that uh, these appeals will start um, you know, getting disposed of. Uh, there have been many suggestions about how to do it. There was once upon a time, a talk about a specialized judicial branch in the income tax department itself. I don't know how workable is this, but as long as officers take posting in the appeals as something that they are not comfortable with, there would always be justification of finding out or identifying people who have a neck for the judicial work and who would probably be inclined and motivated to do it. One thing is certain, apart from whatever legislative amendment which has been made, you will need some out of the box thinking. You will need to, uh, you know, depending on what variables you have, you can't have a straight jacket formula for everything. What worked in the IT, it may or may not work elsewhere. But you will need to address this issue as to what, how exactly we have to ensure that these appeals are disposed of. Then, then there'll be issues regarding jurisdiction, appeals transfer patient, uh, taking place from CIT appeal to joint commissioner and vice versa. But then good move, uh, you know, certainly something in, in right direction. And uh, I'm sure it is you know, of interest to the professionals also, because at the end of the day, their efficiency depends on the efficiency of the department in, in continuing with the matter in disposing of the things with you. So that is something which is very positive. And I'm sure which is probably going to help uh, professionals, help taxpayer, and which is going to help people reach tax certainty faster. 100 uh, new people, joint commissioners and initial commissioners working in this is, is something quite, quite uh, substantial. Now, third point on which the amendment is made so far as the appellate process is concerned, that is with regard to 171 uh, AAB, AAC, AD, et cetera. This is just with respect to those such cases, 68, 69 uh, additions and uh, the entries, which uh, fake entries or the entries which are right, but they don't find place where the powers have been given to, powers were given the last uh, budget to the commissioners for making the additions. Now, uh, commissioner appeals, et cetera. Now, so far as this is only a consequential adjustment and it, it doesn't uh, have much much you know, substance. Then there are issues with regard to 154 in respect to 263 matters uh, by the principal commissioners, principal directors, where again, the kind of amendment which has been made, which is more of a consequential amendment than, uh, you know, rather than having an amendment of substance. As we talk about it, there's one thing which comes to my mind, 
and that is with regard to 154 by the DRC. I was hoping that at least in this budget, this some clarity will come because there's some kind of a dichotomy so far as 154 by the DRP is concerned. Uh, since DRP is not falling in the uh, definition of the income tax authority under section 116, that's not covered by 154 of the act, even though under rule 13 of the DRP rules, you nevertheless have the power to rectify. We're still not clear about what is the time limit about the mechanism. So I'm sure probably in you know one of the uh, at, at a later stage, this issue also is, is taken up and uh, the clarity is brought about the 154 uh, by the DRP itself or its base case. Now, so far as prosecution is concerned, there are two changes and which are, um, I would think, get a very uh, peripheral level. One change is, of course, uh, with regard to the amendment in 276B. Um, and of course, there's a corresponding amendment 271 capital C also uh, on the tax deductions under 194R, 194 194S, 194 VA, et cetera because these were the benefits of acquisite in respect of a business, transfer of virtual digital asset and online gaming winning, uh, uh, online uh, game winnings, which is coming now. Uh, if, you, if there's a uh, beach in this regard, then the, uh, this also comes in the scope of the 271 capital C and 271 uh, uh, and 276B. Now, so far as uh, 276A is concerned about which honorable finance minister, uh, said that uh, it's an attempt for decriminalization and it's in the process of decriminalization. Undoubtedly, that's something that comes. Uh, but nevertheless, we must clear in mind the fact that the provisions of the uh, in bankruptcy code, they uh, override the provisions of the act. And since now you have a separate solvency code anyway, and the role of the liquidator is governed by this. So to that extent, uh, to what extent does section 178 it's still whole good and to what extent it should be, there should be a prosecution for non-compliance for, uh, for ensuring uh, that the uh, taxes which are due have not been kept aside or taking the approval. Uh, it, it, it wouldn't really make much sense to me because when 178 itself is superseded or is uh, overshadowed by the IBC provisions, they would not be uh, much to do um, this. Now, uh, these are the small things, but then there are a few things which I thought somebody could probably, uh, these were required to be dealt with with respect to the tribunal also, with respect to the institution where I worked for a long time. I was hoping that there will be some amendment in section 252A, which is the concert, which is a sort of linkage, uh, uh, you know, between the, which deals with the service conditions of the people who join prior to the reforms taking place. Because 252A, if you are aware, it deals with section 184 of the Finance Act uh, 2017, which has anyway become uh, irrelevant today when you, uh, after the uh, Terminal Reforms Act and the rules have come into play. But there's one anomaly in this, that if somebody who is joined the tribunal prior to uh, the uh, reforms and you know four-year tenure taking place he used to be promoted and it's taken as an appointment because whether you are appointed as a vice president that's also an appointment then he ends up getting just four years well nobody has an issue with the interpretation that the government has given that's uh, that's probably that's how the law stands as it is but somebody has to take a policy decision about whether they can be disincentive for promotion whether somebody on his promotion may lose a few years of his job. Of course, as, as disciplined government servants, the affected people will never even talk about it. I'm sure they will not be even happy that I'm talking about it. But I think this is time that government, instead of simply interpreting this, government takes a conscious call as to what extent 252A has to be capped in this form. Of course, even without the amendment with the help of General Process Act, one could justify certain interpretations. But I would think that this, this was a time when everybody was expecting that there has to be a conscious decision about the fact whether any tribunal officers, tribunal members can be incentivized for their going for promotion. And this uh, alarming, sad situation that some of our very, very bright members, I mean, each one of them is better than each other. I had at least three of them in my benches when I was in job. They did not even opt for being considered for promotion. 
uh, I would have thought this issue was required to be addressed. I hope and I pray that maybe in the times to come, this issue gets uh, considered and the government takes call one way or the other, whatever way it thinks this. Similarly, for the faceless tribunal, which is uh, still some, uh, you know, something uh, about which there's no clarity, we still have time of one more year. But it appears that the stakeholders have, have some uh, reservations about the faceless tribunal. So, I mean, we need not do everything in a particular way. If the way the faceless uh, first appealer process has gone, it is not necessary that something like the same uh, is to be done at the level of the IT80. But perhaps the time has come that some call is to be taken about it, about this, about the manner in which it is to be implemented. Is it to be mellowed down? Is it to be discarded? We, uh, you know, rather than leaving these things as these are, Today, you have a tribunal where unprecedented infrastructure development has taken place, uh, particularly in the regime of uh, Justice Bhatt and uh, Mr. Pannu. They have done unimaginable work in the infrastructure development. We are, we are ready for the next generation of uh, technology. The kind of uh, work that has been done in the last few years is incredible. I think we have to, we have to build on this. We have to see what, at to what level we can introduce the technology and the technology can be introduced only when we have a statutory framework for this. The, the framework that we have about the faceless the tribunal, probably it needs more clarity and it needs some concrete steps with the, without you know, making drastic changes in the existing system, but making the best out of the infrastructure which has been created, out of the uh, work, commendable work which the tribunal has done in the last few years, particularly, and then to make the best out of it. Uh, second, uh, of course, one consideration I always uh, think about is uh, uh, the catchment area of the tribunal presidency. Um, if you have a seven years requirement and then you want a tax judge, then probably it's time, I'm sure the government must have applied its mind to it. But I, from my uh, uh, from my narrow vision, I would say, I would have thought that it's the time we need greater application of mind about this. What kind of people are required? We have people inside the tribunal who need to be at the hem of the affairs. Are they not good enough? What is the feedback that we have from two experiments we had in the last few years regarding taking, taking people from outside? There were billion judges and their contribution has been immense in many fields. But uh, is it what the government expected? Or, or is, uh, you know, of what is today required to make the best use of this second appellate forum, particularly at a time when in the years to come, there has to be, you know, there's going to be so much of work for the tribunal. It's going to play such a critical role. So maybe some uh, more clarity on this would have been in order, but these are all wishes. Uh, yeah, everything I mentioned to you, that's all uh, which I find so far as the, uh, um, amendments in the budgets are concerned and which I thought it could be more areas. If you have some questions, I'll be happy to answer this. Insightful session. So I have one question coming up for, so why has the government not addressed the authority for advanced ruling board dispute resolution infrastructure as yet? What has happened to the opening of new branches, chairman appointment, et cetera? This would help us clearing pendency of a lot of cases. What are your views? See, on a very personal note, I think judicial work is something which administrative officers do not really are much inclined to see. They see it as a kind of you know necessary evil rather than as a, a core professional area. Now, uh, I, I I don't know now the way the authority for advanced ruling has been reconstituted as a board of advanced ruling. I don't even know in what form is it going to evolve, or how judicious will it be, and what kind of faith people have in it. Ultimately, every institution is as good as the people, as the faith that the citizenry has in it. No, right. Probably it's not on the priority and it's not as much on the taxpayers, uh, uh, you know, wish list also as to what do they want from this. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more that having a robust system of advanced ruling would reduce considerable burden from the judicial forums, and that is uh, that contributes much more to the tax certainty than anything. Than anything else. That's a good idea. Next, we have 
what are your opinion to reduce number of litigations under income tax oh god see <laughs> uh, that is something interesting uh, first of all what i have to realize that if I, this is what i believe from my experience that 50% of the appeals by the income tax department are the appeals which the officers themselves know are not required to be done as i was saying just either to keep the issue alive or to keep themselves safe you know sometimes they are under the uh, apprehension that if i don't file an appeal tomorrow i might be blamed for this so we need to have a strong system about uh, ensuring you know when that the people who take decision bona fide decisions in the performance of their duties are protected so as uh, when uh, when this thing comes into play i think number of uh, appeals from the department will reduce secondly i would also think that sometimes judiciary is also to blame because we are so inconsistent that uh, even if somebody is making a shoot the moon request he has a genuine hope that some bench might help him out from this so when you try to be uh, too uh, unpredictable too you know too generous then also you have too many uh, litigation and finally the kind of uh, work which is done at the assessment level that is the ultimately you know that is where the work is being created if these officers work uh, in a more uh, in a manner which is more responsive to society and which is the you know and in accordance with the policies of the government without fear without worries and without being uh, you know seen as a kind of uh, my bap approach then the problems will not arise but the trouble is that many of us we still live in the legacy where once you have a government position to hold you think you are the boss and you decide what is to be done there so much of uh, you have a tendency to believe that you have unfettered discretion now these illusions also create the kind of work which happens and uh, and finally i think It's, it's at the cost of the taxpayer. Every time there's a litigation, I mean, every judge has to realize this: that the, his salaries, his perks, is everything at the cost of a helpless taxpayer who has been wronged. Very well said. One hopes and prays this is controlled. Can I take few more? Please, please. So, uh, R one forty three three order covered under jurisdiction of Joint Commissioner Appeals. From the quick look at the section, I found yes. as the amendment takes place because if you look at uh, at, at their first roman roman i it says an order being an intimation under so so where the assessor of or any order of assessment under sub section 3 of section 143 or 144 so answer is there in the in the section itself answer is yes but it will of, of course be subject to a monetary limit which we will see in the times to come as to what is the monetary limit that they put within that monetary limit 14333 will be covered correct so uh, i don't know if i should ask you this we have got in chat box t ashok bans has asked so what is your opinion on the usage of the word my lord in the i that uh, of the word my lord oh god i used to get very uncomfortable about it it shouldn't be there see uh, all you you know uh, i do not know of any judicial officer who would like to be addressed as my lord but people who are appearing in that court they want to take them to a level where they they actually start believing that they are very highly respected people and you know this is the man who is making them so uh, comfortable so this is more of a courtesy of the lawyers than the you know than the desire of the judicial officers and i personally i mean more so because i was an accountant member every time somebody said my lord in the my court room i used to think uh, he or she is addressing only the judicial member because i had already hit the ceiling Uh -huh. uh, hard in the traveler. It's very. Really I mean, on a uh, as a as a as a normal citizen, I think uh, this is very kind of a feudal uh, thing. It should be you know done away with. Uh, there is one more question. Oh, uh, this is about the about the pillar one and two proposals of the OECD are good enough for the enactment under the Indian tax law. what amendment are needed if any now so far as the uh, yes yes ridima go ahead yes sir uh, so should i repeat the question do you think that the current pillar one and two proposals of oecd are good enough for enactment under income tax laws what amendments are needed if any no you said you are going to answer the question that's what i read there uh, 
No, 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 no. Actually, you were answering, answering no, that. As, as a matter of fact, many people were expecting. I was one of them. We were, we were hoping for some amendments so far as pillar two is concerned, because that's where the amendments are required. As to what amendments are needed, it's quite a complex issue, because if you have to have these rules coming into place, then it's a complex set of, uh, uh, it's it's a it's a complex set of variables which will play a role in this. I'm not too sure about the pillar one because that's where the additional revenue question comes. Pillar two is certainly yes. Are okay. the CPA orders exceedable to efficient number of Correct, correct. And one is there in the chat, uh, another uh, chat box. Should I read it, sir? Yeah, please. So the CIT appease orders are exhibited to rectification under section 154. But many a times the CIT appease sometimes delay this just to be on safe side and either the appeal is preferred. You take on this, sir? You must, as I was saying earlier also, that, uh, you know, commissioner, when you see commissioner appeals, departmental representatives, people sitting in the DRT, you must understand they are essentially administrative officers. They are tax administrators performing judicial functions. And performing judicial function is not a part of their daily, you know, uh, which is something when they do their entire career. It's only in some segments which they do it. So their comfort level with doing the judicial work is probably, in, I mean, not in all cases, but in many cases, an average comfort level of sticking their uh, you know, neck out on judicial issues, likelihood is much lower than they're not in a judicial forum. Now, when you say about mistake apparent and regard, which, which is what uh, 154 deals with, if it is one of those mistakes, which is actually glaring, obvious, and on which there should be, you know, there shouldn't be much debate, and which, which may not have many consequences, that the chances are always there that you will rectify this. But where in the garb of 154, you go to the issues which may have serious ramifications. Of course, 154 may also have serious ramifications. My experience is that, uh, Commissioner appeals are generally little reluctant or they are not as aggressive as they otherwise, as knowledgeable and as wise they are. They, you don't find them as aggressive in taking those calls. So it's always safer. Um, and remember, uh, because in any event, if it's a mistake apparent on the record, then it's something surely appealable also. You have a much better chance because the scope of uh, work which will have to be done in a normal appeal is, is essentially much, much broader than what is done in 154. So, I mean, that, that makes immense sense. And then uh, traditionally, and uh, I'm proud to say this, that this institution where I worked for 22 and a half long years, this is uh, a very, um, uh, I should say, uh, judicious institution and which is known to take tough calls, stick its neck out, you know, whenever required for the cause of taxpayers. So you are, you, you know, you are much safer. And today, courtesy non-disposal of the appeals by the commissioner appeals, we have so little institution in our and, in our um, tribunal, the chances are that the appeal you file is you know will come up for hearing in two months, three months time, and uh, pr probably uh, commission appeals will take that much of time for even picking up one fifty four for hearing. So to the last query for the session, so will the joint commissioner appeals appointment be within the current rank of tax officer within the department, or would fresh appointments are going to be made? I, 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 you know, normally I'm not, uh, I shouldn't even answer this because that is something I do not know. But the answer is so obvious. Uh, there can't be fresh appointments for this. There has right. to be present uh, field of, you know, present uh, strength of officers. The only thing is, you know, the finance minister and of, co and of course, you know, people at the, other people who are part of her team, I'm sure the, you know, right from the, uh, the chairman, uh, chairman CBDT to revenue secretary, they have been thoughtful enough. They have been, I, I should say, they have been proactive enough to understand that this is the time you need additional hands right. to get rid, to you know get rid of this pendency, and that is a very welcome sign. That's you know that's where you feel proud of the present administration, which has its ears firmly to the ground. Uh, if you need extra people, give it to them. And, uh, that seems to be a welcome step, as I said from the current officers, as it is there are many officers who complain that they don't have much work. So they'll have some work elsewhere. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much, sir, for such an engaging section, uh, session and interaction. It was a pleasure having you, sir. It was a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you so much.